In this 10-year anniversary edition of Nintendo Unboxed, we're going to be revisiting the U.S. version of the Nintendo 64. If you're interested in my original unboxing of this console, you can click the link to it in the description for this video. So here it is, Nintendo's Fun Machine. The Nintendo 64 released in 1996 in the United States, just a few months after it released in Japan in the same year. So this is an early edition of the console. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have my original launch edition that I was lucky enough to get on launch day because, like so many times before, as a kid, I made the unfortunate decision of selling or trading my video games and consoles. But I was lucky enough at some point to get a new inbox uh, Nintendo 64. And this is, this is, even though it's not the launch version, it is one of the earlier versions. And uh, as we go through the packaging here, I'll point out how you can kind of uh, identify that. So right away on the front here we've got the console and one controller. That is what you would be getting in this original configuration with no game. The hardware itself was quite expensive as usual but uh, to further cut costs and to kind of mitigate the shortage because when this console released in 1996 it was super hard to get as were many of the games. And in addition to the shortage of the quantity of the games that were available, well, Nintendo had a hard time getting third parties to sign on with the Nintendo 64, mainly because of their uh, draconian licensee rules that they had in place with the Super Nintendo Entertainment System and Nintendo Entertainment System, and also because they made the decision to stick with cartridges when all other video game systems, such as the Sony PlayStation and the Sega Saturn, were opting towards optical media in the form of the CD. So Nintendo was trying to say, well, we're going to have quality games over quantity. And that was certainly the case with their first party games, as it always is, but not necessarily with third party games. So the Nintendo 64 had quite a small library when you compare it to its predecessors in uh, of Nintendo systems and certainly uh, when we get into the PlayStation camp. A lot more games released for that. But they are going to tout the games here kind of on the right hand side at point three right here on the packaging. I enjoy the aesthetic where they kind of go with the wireframe. You see the photo that kind of converts into wireframe that uh, was used in their 3D modeling because the 3D graphics that is uh, what was the main push with the system and we would see that right down to the controller here with that new analog stick but the machine experience unsurpassed 64-bit graphics and CD quality sound running at an awesome 94 megahertz the controller reach new levels of accuracy and play control with the ergonomically designed controller featuring 14 buttons and analog control stick and as odd as the N64 controller is and was back then, I tell you, when we first saw this thing in pictures, we were like, what? My friend and I used to call this the tooth because we, we thought it looked like a big old molar. But as strange as it is and as much as this analog stick will wear out, I'll tell you, in my opinion, the games that it was designed for, namely Super Mario 64, Never in the history of a video game where is the development of the controller and the game itself so closely related. I don't want to play uh, Super Mario 64 with any other controller with this one. I think the analog stick is very, very uh, highly calibrated for that game. Because I tried it on the Virtual Console with the Wii and it just doesn't work for me. I like having this controller. As strange as it is. The games. Graphics put you in real-time 3D environments. Get ready for speed and excitement in an endless array of perspectives. Which, yeah, with these C buttons to kind of control your camera, that's what they were going for there. Plug and play. Stereo AV cables are included for the highest quality picture and stereo sound. Plus, you can have your N64 and Super NES connected to your TV simultaneously. Again, like we would see with the redesigned Nintendo Entertainment System, we've got this note here, see back, uh, see back for connection information. Because this was kind of the transition point where RF was no longer the norm and composite video and stereo audio was the norm. Even though there were superior video outputs such as S-Video and RGB and SCART, uh, this was the standard. But a lot of people were still using RF. And uh, I remember some Christmas mornings, uh, people were very, very 
very disappointed they couldn't play their Nintendo 64 out of the box because they didn't have the right connector. So on the back, Nintendo tried to let you know what you would need. But here we've got um, the first long panel in the green color. We would see this uh, for the first time with the Super Famicom packaging. We've got the four-color Nintendo 64 logo, which was featured here for the first time. And uh, it would also herald the unification of Nintendo's branding and aesthetic. The console was being called the same thing in all regions for the first time, probably in an effort to avoid confusion and uh, to cut production costs so they didn't have to design and manufacture two different versions of a video game console. But uh, here on the green panel that matches the green panels on the uh, Nintendo 64 logo, we have this cast of characters. This is one of the ways you can tell how new or old your uh, Nintendo 64 is. If it has Fulgore, Bowser, Mario, and a Stormtrooper, you can be uh, you can be sh assured that uh, it's one of the first runs of the Nintendo 64. And then turning it around to the first short side here, we've got that same cast of characters on a red panel. And the second long side, same cast of characters on a blue panel. And I think you can guess what we're going to find on the final short side. But there's a little bit of a variation. Definitely yellow, as you probably guessed, but now they're kind of advertising the different colors of the controllers here and some of the features. Number one, it's multi-purpose. 14-button control provides ideal layout for any type of game. Precision control, ergonomically designed controller featuring 14 buttons and analog control stick. Save your moves. Optional Nintendo 64 controller pack provides custom memory for each player. Which, okay, yeah, but I remember at the time, Nintendo was simultaneously kind of touting that one of the benefits of cartridges is that you can save right on it. So why do we need a separate memory card like the, uh, the Sony PlayStation would have? And uh, as it turned out, it wasn't used in the majority of games. But this uh, port, of course, would later be used for other things like the Rumble Pack and the Transfer Pack. So it had other uses as well. And then here we see multicolor. Choose from a variety of colors sold separately. So this was the first uh, standard issues of colors uh, that they would get for the controllers. And later on, as we know, the Nintendo 64 console itself would be released in an equally stunning array of different colors, both in that Fantastic series that were kind of the translucent neon colors with controllers to match and specialty editions like the Pikachu edition. So even though Nintendo had unified the aesthetic of the console in all of the regions, there were still lots of different color variants. But I always tend to prefer uh, the original. I love this charcoal look of the controller and then the kind of primary color original controllers. Those are my favorite. So turning it around to the back here, we've got a little synopsis of the console itself. The Machine. Experience a quantum leap in graphics realism with the Nintendo 64 system. Real-time rendering and awesome anti-alias graphics create a heart-pumping virtual gaming world. Plus, you can have your N64 and Super NES connected to your TV simultaneously. See instruction book, which we will do. You could also hook the NES up at the same time, too. The controller. The Nintendo 64 controller gives you complete control over every move. The unique analog control stick allows you to move in 360 degrees. There's a quick action trigger on the bottom and a multi-directional control pad. Plus, the N64 controller pack, sold separately, can save game statistics and data. Your favorite controller button configuration, built-up character strengths, and more. So I always find this a little bit of an interesting marketing difference between uh, Japan and the United States. Uh, you saw in my unboxing of the Japanese version of the Nintendo 64, there really isn't a whole lot of marketing on the box. And as a matter of fact, the bottom of the box in the Japanese version is just a block of styrofoam. No additional information. But we've already read three different descriptions of the controller on the back, on the side, and on the front. So interesting uh, how Nintendo of America chose to market versus Nintendo of Japan. 
Technical questions? Nintendo's Consumer Service Department is ready to help. Call the number Monday through Saturday. And uh, they've got a little bit of a diagram here to help you realize what you have going on at home and whether or not it matches up here with what you'll actually need to make the connections. So at the time, VCRs usually had the RCA uh, composite uh, video in, uh, and some TVs did as well, and that is what you would need. But again, like we saw with the redesigned Super Nintendo Entertainment System, if your TV or VCR does not have audio video connections as shown above, you will need a Nintendo 64 RF switch and RF modulator set, which is sold separately. Very important information to know if you want to be able to hook this up right when you get it home. So another way you can tell uh, whether or not you've got a one of the first issues of the Nintendo 64 are the games on the back. You might have to do some research as to when the games came out, but we've got a lot of games here that were released in 1997. Uh, so this is probably one of the second runs of the box here, given the games that we're seeing. Got Star Fox 64, Turok, Mario Kart 64, GoldenEye, Cruisin' USA, lots of the popular, still newer, uh, some of the older games at the time here, some of the first run games, but uh, within the first year. And then here, like we saw with the redesigned uh, Super Nintendo Entertainment System, this cutout here so that you could see the serial number that's actually on the console. So the cashier would scan the UPC with the price and then scan your serial number to pair it with your purchase in order to prevent fraudulent returns. So let's open it up and see what's inside. Let's see the fun machine. So like the Super Nintendo Entertainment System and the Nintendo Entertainment System before it, we've got all of our components safely stored away here in a block of styrofoam. And as per usual, we'll start off with the little baggie of documentation that we have. First thing we saw was the instruction manual. So we have that. We've got the Consumer Precautions, which has changed the aesthetic a little bit to match the a Nintendo 64 branding. And then we've got our Nintendo Power subscription. Now this is a clear difference I remember between this version and my original launch version. This one has Mario Kart 64 on it. Mine had Super Mario 64 on it. So the Nintendo Power subscription uh, was a little bit different. Store 64. Now that you've got the world's best video game system, get the most out of it. Subscribe to Nintendo Power Magazine and get N gear at Store 64. So yeah, they would use that N in a lot of advertising slogans. Lots of cool gear actually. You've got a game pack holder, system tote, Star Fox 64 soundtrack CD, N64 watch and cap. Got some t-shirts as well. Got the album for a Nintendo 64 trading card set. Probably available through uh, the Super Power Club. Nintendo, po uh, Nintendo collectible plushies. And then some more images of those totes. Really cool. Some really cool items there. So then here on the back, we got... We saw the front. Here's your order form. You could call the 1-800 number or you could fill out the form. And here talking about uh, the Nintendo uh, 64 Player's Guides. We saw some of these in my first party Player's Guide playlist there. We took a look at uh, the ones that had that N64 aesthetic with the four colors on it. And kind of an entertainment center there. A plastic box to put your console in. And then some N64 game cases. So some really cool stuff you could get through Nintendo Power at the time. And then taking a look at the instruction booklet here, how to connect uh, with the AV cable, RF switch and modulator, and then connecting the N64 and Super NES Control X together. So right on the front here, some quick references for the pages you'd need to make the connection that you wanted. So this book is taking on a little bit of a different aesthetic here. We do have the table of contents still and the seal of quality. Diagrams of the components included. 
how to make connections with the AV cable and if your TV has only mono audio you'd have to uh, purchase a Y adapter to bring the stereo audio down to mono but if you did have stereo you could use the cable as it was lots of different AV connections that you could make here's the instructions for using that RF modulator if your TV had only that threaded coaxial input and the adapter you'd need if it didn't even have that have that if it only had the screws how to hook up your two consoles the Super Nintendo Entertainment System and the N64 by daisy chaining RF switches together you could even do that with the um, with the N, uh, with the Nintendo Entertainment System, but since it's an analog signal, it would probably degrade a bit. How to insert that very unique power adapter here? We saw a very similar power adapter in the Japanese version of the N64. The only difference was the uh, that the house current between the regions is a little bit different, so they're they're tweaked to uh, to work with that a little bit better. But aside from that, this would be one of the first times we'd see. Um, some similarities between the AC adapters in the Nintendo consoles. How to hold that mysterious new controller, the three different positions, and making connections to the four controller ports. How to operate, choosing your channel with the RF switch. Remember, RF is broadcasting over a channel, and you might get better uh, reception on channel three or channel four, so you got to pick that. Putting your cartridge in and being sure that the uh, analog stick is in the neutral position when you turn it on. Otherwise, whatever position it's in will be red as the neutral position and you will get what we now call Joy-Con Drift. More information about turning the power on and off and using the controller. And then troubleshooting information here. No images. The Super Nintendo Entertainment System and Nintendo Entertainment System usually had images, but just text here along now with our warranty information and parts order form. And then some blank pages. So there's the instruction manual for the Nintendo 64. Let's take a look at the console itself. Get it out of its bag here. And there it is, the fun machine in the flesh. So the top here, we'll talk about that first. Uh, that has one of the main differences between the US and the Japanese version of the console here. If we take a look inside, we see kind of a gray colored plastic chassis. And then the little bumps here are tabs. Those are what are designed to be physical region locking and I'll show you how that works here. Put our console down and I have right here two different versions of Wave Race. I've got the US version and then the Japanese uh, Shindo edition, the one that actually uses the Rumble Pack. So there is no software lockout with N64 games. Just like the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, Nintendo keyed the cartridges in an effort to have a physical lockout. So you can see the bottoms are a little bit different. And we get an even better perspective on the back. So each of the uh, N64 variants for Japan and the United States, that colored plastic chassis for the, uh, for the cartridge had a different position for that tab. With the U.S. version, it's on the very ends. And then in the Japanese version, it's kind of uh, in between where the cartridge opening starts, and, or the PCB board opening starts and the cartridge ends. And it's a little bit wider as well. So this difference makes it so that you cannot physically get the uh, PCB board to interface with the cartridge slot in the console that it's not designed for. So, of course, the U.S. version fits and the Japanese version does not. So that's the main difference that we see between the U.S. and the Japanese version. Other than that, the power switch and reset button remain largely the same as does the sticker for the jumper pack. 
the Nintendo 64, I had memory expansion, but it did need some sort of null jumper pack just to make some sort of connection in the system so that it would boot up. But that sticker includes uh, English and Japanese, so that was common to both of them. On the front panel here, we've got the four controller ports, which was a major selling feature and would become hugely popular in games like GoldenEye. So just like with the uh, Super Nintendo Entertainment System, they're using dots. One, two, three, and four dots for players one through four. On the sides, nothing of note, just some venting. On the back, you've got kind of the recessed chamber so that that AC adapter would fit in it. And I quite like the design because that means that you end with a regular wall plug, which we'll see once we take a look at the AC adapter. So the bulk of it sits inside the system. And then you've got your multi-AV out, which would also work with S-Video. But I believe you need to mod an N64 to get anything uh, else out of it uh, in regards to an RGB signal. On the bottom, we've got the, uh, the specs here for the system on this panel, and then the serial number that we saw peeking through that window in the packaging. I've taken the extra step of adding some uh, rubberized feet to the front so that the console has a little bit more grip when it sits. Otherwise, since Nintendo saved, uh, started saving money towards the middle of the lifespan of the Super Nintendo Entertainment System by only giving you two rubber feet instead of all four. So unfortunately, the front of your console would kind of swing a little bit, but having those rubber feet really make it more grippy. But what that will do is make it so that you cannot use a peripheral like the 64DD. So my Japanese version, as you saw, did not have anything blocking, uh, blocking those uh, holes where the posts of the 64DD would, uh, would uh, rest there. But speaking of the 64DD, the N64 in the United States would sport the same EXT port for that or any other peripheral that would come out to use it, but unfortunately we would never get anything like that. Much like the Super Nintendo Entertainment System and the Nintendo Entertainment System before it. In the United States, we tend not to use the EXT port. So that is the Nintendo 64 control deck. Let's take a look and see what else was included in the package. The first thing we'll take a look at is this brand new controller. Certainly strange looking back then and even by today's standards, but uh, we would see the unification uh, between Japanese and U.S. and European models. Just a Nintendo logo etched in the controller front here. No branding changes because, hey, the name of the system is the same. You get a length of cord here, not quite as long. I believe this is a six-foot cord versus the eight-foot cord that you got with the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, but oh well. And this, of course, is the standard light gray version of the controller that you would get, and the plug matched. So that was kind of a nice touch. Uh, when you plugged it into one of the four controller ports on the front, you could see which color clearly was plugged into which port. So there was no guesswork there among that mess of four cables that you would have. So there really isn't too much of a variation between the controllers in the regions, but I have noticed throughout the years that some of them are made in Japan and some of them are made in China. In my unboxing video for the Japanese version, we saw that controller was made in Japan. This one was made in China. Outside of that uh, little difference on the, on the controller plastic here, I haven't noticed any other differences uh, between those regions of manufacture. So, and then finally here, we've got our AV cables. Remember, this is the way that uh, Nintendo was standardizing the hookups. One thing you want to be aware of, though, is that there exist two variations, one with a black plug and then another with a gray plug. Starting towards the middle of the life of the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, or at least by the time when the Super Nintendo Entertainment System 2 was released, uh, they changed the color of the plug from black, uh, so from gray to black. So for collector's purposes, you want to be sure that with an N64 you get a black one, not a gray one. And then finally here we have the AC adapter. Very unique for the N64. A 
And just like I mentioned, it ends with a nice regular plug that fits nicely in the wall and doesn't take up more than one outlet like a big wall wart brick would. The brick actually sits halfway inside the chassis of the Nintendo 64. Pretty much the same uh, AC adapter that you would get uh, with the Japanese version. The only difference is this is rated to accommodate the uh, 120 volts of household current that we have here in the United States. So a little bit of a difference there with the household current. You would definitely want to make sure that if you're in the United States using either a U.S. or a Japanese version of the N64 that you're using the U.S. AC adapter. And if you're in Japan or any other region that you're using the AC adapter for that region because it's better designed to uh, accommodate that household current. So there you have the U.S. version of the Nintendo 64. I hope you enjoyed this video and will stay tuned to World of Nintendo for lots more like it, especially those in the 10 year anniversary of the Nintendo Unboxed series in which I'm reshooting several of my older unboxing videos in an attempt to upgrade the video quality a bit. So the calendar for those has been on the screen and in addition to the 10 year anniversary of Nintendo Unboxed I've got lots more content for you here at World of Nintendo. So stay tuned and until the next one, take care.